Shalom Chavirim! I'm Rafi. I'm Daniela. And you are watching or listening to B'nai Kiva's brand new podcast, Past and Present. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify and Facebook. Where we'll be interviewing Chavirim of B'nai Kiva of the past and present to share with you some exciting insights into their lives. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next installment of Past and Present. We have two wonderful guests in this week's podcast. Familiar faces, present faces, and um, we're going to hear a lot about them. So I guess it's not worth doing an introduction because they will explain who they are and what what they are, amazing people. Uh, Oh, before we begin, uh, I'm Rafi. I'm Daniela. Nice to see you all again. Okay, so without any further ado, um, Rav Joel and Sarah Kellingsberg, please introduce yourselves. Say a, if you can say a bit about who you are, what you do, where you're from, etc. The floor is yours. Thank you, Rafi and Daniela. Great to be here. Um, as you said, I'm Rav Joel and this is Sarah. We are the Rav and Ravanich Lechav Ben Akiva in the UK. Uh, we've been here for the last uh, two and a half years. We came over with Mizrahi, UK, and Shlichim, and a very, very big part of what we do is, of course, uh, working together with Bnei Akiva, which is absolutely fantastic. So, uh, yeah, as you just heard, I'm Sarah Kennisberg. Um, before we came on Shlichut, when we were living in Jerusalem, in Israel, I was actually an organic chemist working in a biotech company. Um, did a bit of a switch around when we came to England, but really, really loving the opportunity that it's given us. Um, you might be able to tell from my accent that I'm originally Mancunian, um, left after high school and went to Israel, but grew up, born and bred in Manchester, um, spent many a Shabbatot at the um, Manchester Bayit um, as a Hanukha, as a Madracha. Um, I was actually Ellie Maman's Madracha, if that gives me no credit for anything. I'm going to take credit for his path in Bnei Kiva. Ellie yeah, <laughs> he was probably he was literally like seven at the time, but I know it was very oh influential. My God. Of course, all the um, way. <laughs> um, and then yeah, I, I mean, I grew up really in Bnei Akiva, Machanot, Israel Machane. I even took camp um, once before we made Aliyah. Actually, after I made Aliyah, I came back and did BMP camp with the marvelous uh, Michael Rainsbury. He was Rosh of it. Nice. Um, and yeah, and then off made Aliyah to Israel, met a random South African in Israel, as you do. Um, and the rest is history, as they say. There's a lot, there might be a lot more random South Africans here in London, but uh, yeah. as, as you can hear from my accent as well, if you can understand it, um, also not from London, but from South Africa. But you forgot to mention um, another interaction that we had with uh, BA UK before we came back to be Raven Raven um, this was my first interaction with BA UK, which is that our engagement party was in the Salford Bayat. So, wow. Uh, Huge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually uh, didn't grow up in BA. I grew up in South Africa, uh, in Johannesburg. Uh, I was in Beitar, which is another youth movement, another Zionist youth movement. Um, grew up in a home that was actually not you know, religious growing up. So very, very much Am Israel, very, very much uh, Eretz Israel. Sorry to Israel, I came a little bit later, but uh, always, uh, you know, v- very, very strong designers, very, very rooted in what it means to be part of the Jewish people, what it means to have, you know, Israel as a home. And uh, ended up in Israel, Yeshivat HaKotel, uh, doing Hezder there, seven years. Afterwards, went to Eretz Chemda, and then, uh, and then we ended up back here in, in London. Temporarily, temporarily, we're, uh, we're not going to be here forever. Right. Amazing, wow. So cool. So... Can you tell us a bit more about, like, I know, Ravanit, Sarah, you mentioned that, like, you made Aliyah straight after high school. Um, what was the deciding factor there? And then also for Rav Joel, like, when and how did you decide and make Aliyah? You know, it's a great question. I mean, I, as I said, I grew up in, um, in B'nai Akiva. I went to a Zionist school. I grew up in a, a family where um, I heard all about how my parents had wanted to make Aliyah and for some reason didn't, and my grandparents had wanted to make Aliyah and for some reason didn't. And you know, it was just a, a huge value. And um, I went to Yavna Girls School and we had incredible, incredible shlichim. 
and um, Rabbi Pelez was my head teacher when I was in Yavna. He actually came back last year or two years ago. Yeah. He was at Jaliach again, um, which is just amazing. And wow. just everybody, like all of these things just, just had such an experience, um, made such an impression on me. And ultimately everything came together. And when, um, I remember when I went on Israel Machana actually and had my um, off Shabbat and I went to my sister's um, she actually made Aliyah before me. I have to put that in. That was a um, definitely a helping factor mm -hmm. that I wasn't going by myself. Um, and I went to my sister. She lived in Kiryat Moshe in Jerusalem. And I just remember looking around and feeling that that these people, they don't just learn Torah. They they live it. That like wow. the connection between um, theory and practice and, and just everything that, that regular life was just on a different level. And you know, we've been blessed to experience that um, firsthand living there. And it's just an amazing opportunity. And, you know, you can read the books about like the cliche thing that only in Israel stories, but, you know, they're really <laughs> true. Like, you know, like I'm sitting in a physical chemistry lecture and this professor who's a world renowned scientist, when asked to explain something that contradicts a, like one of the laws of thermodynamics just points up and is like, there are some things that are, you know, God, God takes control of. Wow. It's, just, it's just amazing. I remember like reaching for my phone and this is at a time when like phones weren't glued to your hand. So like to look for your phone in a lecture was actually quite a big deal. Um, another one I remember actually, this is quite funny, was when we had an open book exam and somebody was asking what would be the best thing to bring in. And my professor was like, for you, a safer tailim. And like, these are cliche and they're just funny stories, but, but it's just, um, it's really an opportunity to to live the life that we learn about and that we talk about, and um, it's yeah, it's just amazing. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say for me, you know, people ask, why did you make Aliyah? You know, what is it about Israel that? Uh, and you know, the answer is very simple: it's home. Um, you know, and uh, you know, to try and put it into words, to try and express, to try and you know, explain. You know, if you haven't felt it, I mean, it's just, it's just to me, to me you know, it's that obvious and it's that simple. I mean, growing up. When I was growing up in South Africa, a lot of people were leaving. You know, immigration was quite common. I remember yeah. you know, school people, whether it was to Israel, to uh, to Australia, to Canada, there were a lot of people uh, leaving all the time. A lot of people spoke about, you know, leaving South Africa. Um, and I remember, you know, we had, you know, we had drilled into our heads, uh, you know, from a young age, as I said, we went to, uh, not necessarily in BA, and that came later, but but, but in Beitan, in my family, you know, my dad was, uh, you know, very, very Zionist. Um, he made Aliyah, you know, when I was uh, when I was 12 years old, I lived with my mom. But um, you know, he, we had drilled into our heads that you know we had somewhere to go, not because you know we needed to leave South Africa, but because we had somewhere to go home, and that was Israel. You both have now been in England for I think two and a half years, if I was listening correctly. Yes, um, and that also means two and a half years of shlicha. So well, we want to use this opportunity now to ask a little bit about your shlichut. Um, so we'd be interested to know how you came to do shlichut in the first place. Was there a particular story or an inkling from a, a, like a younger age? I mean, I assume before you made Aliyah, you didn't say to yourself, I'm going to make Aliyah and then come back, for example, in Sarah's case, to England. Is that a correct assumption? Yeah, yeah that's correct. That's not... Uh... I mean, you mentioned before you mentioned my pillars, and you know, you mentioned the, the, the impact that you know Shlichem had on, on you and your life. Um, I mean, it's not something that we planned, you know, originally. Definitely not when we made Aliyah. Um, you know, as you said, Rafi, we get on the plane. Well, we're going to go, but we're going to come back. That's not, uh, not the way that we did it. I think a little bit later, you know, it, over the past few years, Shlichut to has become a bit more, uh, bit more high profile, but more popular. You know, a lot of our friends. We're on shlichut. We're doing shlichut. We're uh, you know training for shlichut. This kind of thing, you know. So it was something that was kind of there on the in the radar, sort of in the back of our mind. Um, and you know, knowing you know what an impact you can have, knowing what an impact shlichim had on our lives. Um, when an opportunity came up, which was I mentioned after Shvata Kotel, I went to Eretz Chemda, Eretz Chemda in uh, in Yerushalayim, where they opened up a program, which was really a five year, became six years of uh, of training, of studying. Um, but also, you know, learning and, and, and preparing for shlichut. Um, and, you know, and once that opportunity came up, we, we jumped at it with both hands. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because when we... Originally, there was a veto against England. 
I did originally veto it. <laughs> what I was, I'll explain no, that right. in a bit. But <laughs> what I was going to say was that when we um, first signed up for this program that Joel was just talking about, it was a five-year program and we were young and young and naive. I don't know. We were, I was still doing my bachelor's degree. We didn't have children. Like we were quite recently married and we made this decision that then five years, six years down the line, ended up into bringing two children across the, not across the world, but uprooting two children, leaving jobs. And I'm, I'm just glad that we had actually made that decision when we did, because it would have been a lot harder to make it in the position that we did leave. But um, it was, you know, it's, it's been an incredible experience and we're just really glad that we, that we did make that decision. But, um, but yes, I did originally veto England. I didn't want to sort of go back to where I was coming from. I was a bit worried that sort of, um, I would always almost like hold us back by being sort of, oh no, well you, you can't say this and you can't do this because it's the English community, I know them. Um, and it well, was- well, We didn't go to Manchester. That is, yeah. So I, I then like minimized my veto, if that's even a phrase, <laughs> to Manchester. Um, and then this opportunity came up in London, which just seemed to be, um, perfect for us for the positions that we were looking um, and I'm really glad that we took it um, I mean we were looking at a few other places there was an option for Canada there was an option for somewhere in America um, but there's something really nice about especially for me like it's just amazing to be able to work in some of the frameworks that as I said gave me so much when I was growing up and to be able to sort of somewhat give back to them is just um, a great opportunity Right. Definitely. I mean, is it the shikhat that you expected? I don't know what like kind of expectations you came in with. Yeah, the truth is, looking back, I'm not sure what we expected either. I we think. definitely <laughs> did not expect a global pandemic. I'm just going to oh. mark that one there. Yeah, I mean, the last year and a half has been, uh, I think, beyond what, what anybody expected in anything. So, yeah, one of the things I'll say, I'll come back to that. But, you know, coming on shikhat as well, it's given, as I think it's given me a newfound appreciation you know, for people who make aliyah. Um, you know, especially later in life. I mean, I made Aliyah when I was 18 years old, you know, fresh out of high school, you know, no responsibilities, no commitments, no family to bring with, um, you know, no job to move uh, and to, you know, to have experience what it's like, you know, with a family to uproot, to, uh, to move across the world, you know, to another country is not, uh, is not easy, not easy at, at all. Um, so definitely, you know, have a, have a newfound appreciation for anybody who's able to do it. Um, you know, it's an amazing thing, you know, to make Aliyah. Do you manage to turn everything around to make Aliyah? Yeah, it's a talent. I, I am the Rav Shaliyah. Yeah. <laughs> it's part of my job. Um, I mean, for me, I didn't really know what, I literally did not know what to expect. Like it was a big, I knew that it would be an upheaval. I didn't quite know how much. And it was like, it was a big change for me to go from working a, I was going to say nine to five job, but in Israel, it's more like seven till four job um, in a lab to working in education and um and as working together also, which is something that we've never done, as in each of us have had our own things that we're doing, our own profession, so to speak, or studies. And suddenly it's like working together as a team, which um, has been an amazing experience, but is also something that you need to get used to. Um, and so I think I sort of went into Shlichut knowing that I really was not sure what to expect and um, just being, happy with the outcome I mean one day I was just looked down I was actually in the Benegi Babaya I was preparing for a Chabura that I was doing with somebody in a school and something else and I just looked down at my desk and there's like a Masila Yusharim and a this there and a that there and I was just like this is insane that this is what I can do for work to sit here and be learning and um just and socializing with people and that we have this opportunity it's um not something that I'd ever sort of expected and just like reaping the benefits from it, it's, it's just great. Well, uh, if I may, um, I think Sarah said, I don't know, in spite that Rav Joel consistently returns to Aliyah uh, as a to go to, which is, I guess, something that we uh, would love and every Rav Shaliyah, we have that in Rav Joel, which is fantastic. I guess, therefore, when talking about Shlichot and um, leaving Israel, I guess there were, I, I'm assuming there was, um, some, there was some degree of challenge leaving Israel in terms of a ideological relationship with the land 
or with the community that your children uh, grew up in. So in terms of how, if, if, if there were those challenges, how have you, do you think you've succeeded in uh, fulfilling those challenges? And if you haven't yet, uh, what do you think in the you know, upcoming months, et cetera, yeah. will be the way, the ways yeah. around those challenges? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I mean, let's talk a little bit about the challenges first. I mean, before I get to the ideological challenges, you know, what was the biggest challenge of, of coming to England? The first challenge was just getting here. Uh, you know, getting a visa is not, is not easy. His visa, I yeah, was fine. So Sarah has a British passport. The kids have got British passports as a result, so, so they're all okay. Um, but I'd apply for a visa. And you know, I think just about every shaliach will tell you, uh, you know, stories, um, you know, sometimes horror stories, sometimes, you know, less horror stories, but about trying to get a visa, the months it took, you know, the paperwork, that was, yeah. that was a challenge, but we got through that. I mean, I think on the, you know, ideological perspective, one of the things, uh, obviously, you know, I mentioned our kids before, you know, when we came, Sophia was still a baby, Yonatan was, you know, speaking Hebrew fluently. I mean, he understood English. He even had an Israeli accent. It was amazing. And... Oh. Uh, yeah, that, that was something we knew was going to be a challenge when we came. I mean, at the beginning, we tried to speak Hebrew a little bit at home, but you know, it's now at the time we don't speak to each other in Hebrew. And it just the first few times we went back to visit Israel and each time we'd come back you know, for about a day or two, we'd speak Hebrew at home and then, and then we'd switch to English. It was just uh, it didn't really that didn't really work out. So, yeah, if there's any I, consolation, I, my parents did the same because I lived in the <laughs> till I was four and we didn't speak Hebrew at home. It's really difficult. It's really like when you know you're talking to someone whose mother tongue is English, there's something about it that just... Yeah. So they'll learn it again. I mean, so our kids will have, uh, will have fluent English going back and uh, they'll have to Literally. work on the Hebrew as well. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to be away, you know, especially, I'll tell you, I feel it. Um, Yom, Yom Azikar and Yom Atzimot, you know, is the time when, you know, you feel Israel, you know, more than, more, more than any other time in the year. And, you know, to be away, uh, to be away from that, to be here was uh, was really, really challenging. You know, I think one of the things is that, you know, we spent, uh, you know, we were able to give give those days so much meaning is by going to different schools and being in different places and, you know, doing things for the community. You know, we don't, uh, can't really soak in the atmosphere that, you know, you have in Israel. So we create the atmosphere as much as we can. Yeah. And I mean, Rafi, what you said is completely right. Part of the the difficulty of leaving Israel was was literally deciding to leave Israel. And I remember when we drove to the airport in our rental car, because we didn't have our car anymore, um, we were just driving out of Jerusalem and driving past sort of the, the sign that says Brochim Abayim and, and yeah, Shalom, Shalom the way out. was just crazy. As in, we both decided to make Aliyah, we both moved for ideological reasons. Thank God we both had a, um, a successful klita, like it went, um, we had a lot of Siyasa Dishmaya, things went well, we were settled. Um, and to decide to uproot that and to go back to it for me also to go back to where you've decided to leave there's something sort of um, counterintuitive about it but part of what enabled us to do that I think was because of how much and how settled we were in Israel that you know we have the 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 tikva and the um, just hope that when we go back will slot into that as in if we weren't settled in Israel I don't think we would have been able to be like okay we're going to get up and leave for a few years and come back and it will be fine um but there are so many things like it just you know as a like I feel when we arrived here I felt like more of a foreigner than I did living in Israel as in I may have had a British accent but your mindset changes and the way you get used to doing things changes and so whenever anyone like I have friends who think it's hilarious they were friends that I was going to like dorm with when I was in university and things and now I'm back here right. um, and they're all like oh you're not going to go back this time but we I mean we, we are. are like <laughs> we want our kids to go back to living in that environment we want to go back to it um and choosing to go on Shlichut was was definitely um I'm not sure if we knew how big a challenge it would be the going back I don't think we still know what big it ask us again in two years time we might be like oh it was a terrible mistake um no i'm joking hopefully it won't be right, stay tuned for series five everyone exactly <laughs> um but um but yeah as in it's it's hard to decide to leave israel and being here and not being able to travel in the last year and a half you know when we first came we had a bar mitzvah we knew we were going back for we had a summer holiday we knew we were going back for and when the borders closed and not even, and we physically, even though we have Israeli passports and we're Israeli citizens, wouldn't have been allowed back into Israel. That was difficult 
on a sort of psychological level to deal with the fact that I literally cannot go back there right now was was um was quite hard to deal with but you know please god we are moving out of that and anybody who wants will be able to go back soon enough I think even people who haven't been living in Israel it's really highlighted you know how much we value Israel and like the fact that we weren't able to go like you said it, it's home for everyone and to not have that option to go is I think it's made us all appreciate Israel that much more and um, but I actually want to go back to something you said earlier Rabbi and Sarah you you just mentioned about you know sitting there with your Masil at your and being like oh this is my job I'm assuming that Abura was um with with women and therefore I'm just interested to hear like you know having been here for the last two and a half years you know you, you get to work with the community and everything how have you seen the role of women in the Jewish community change or shift since you were a child so it's a really it's a really interesting question it's also a tiny bit difficult to answer because my viewpoint now is just so different I mean obviously mm -hmm. As a child, you experience one thing. As an adult, you experience something else. And as an adult, almost behind the scenes, as a, you know, a rebbetzin of a shul and a, like working in B'nai Kiva and in schools. So I'm very much sort of see what's going on both um, in the forefront and also behind the scenes. So my perspective isn't exactly the same to compare, but I would say that a huge change that I've seen is really just the opportunities for um, learning first and foremost for women and the new, the amount of women role models that are sort of coming out and when I was deciding whether to make Aliyah um after my during my gap year during my year in seminary which was not clear cut I knew at some point I wanted to move I didn't know when the best time would be um, and one of the things that actually pushed me not to come back um was that I was aware that the the opportunities for women and learning programs and things was as far as I'm aware, pretty non-existent at the time. And now, I mean, like, just look around, like, I mean, I'm just going to do a plug here, but it's not for doing a plug. It's because it's an incredible program. There's Lil Modul Al Ahmed that Mizrahi, B'nai Kiva and the US have got on, which is just incredible for um, students in university, female students in university to um, develop their learning and education and being able to be role models and leaders in the community. Um, the chief rabbi has the Mayam program, which is also, it's like groundbreaking. And there are like several yards at Halakha in England that are now trained more, that are training. And you're just seeing more and more these opportunities that, in my opinion, didn't Email exist. Female Batim Midrash. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you can like, now it's like pretty common. And um, and it's just really nice to see, as in that, that women that women or girls have this opportunity and that they have these role models. Um, maybe, I don't know, maybe it would have brought me back to England and I'm almost glad that it didn't do that. But um, <laughs> but it's definitely a good thing to to have about and it's really nice to see. What role do you think BA played in that? I mean, I was never behind the scenes in BA growing, as in I, I like saw it up to the level of like madracha and that was pretty much it. So I, I don't feel so qualified to answer what it would have been like. But I know that BA are doing everything in their power to really sort of um, develop programs, make sure that there are places, um, you know, it's a conversation that we often have, how can we make um, a learning um, opportunity be as open for women? Is it having a separate thing for women so that they feel more um less what's the word less um intimidated perhaps or is it about having mixed things like it's it, you know it's just always on the cards it's a conversation that's always having and developing and um it's one of it's something that they put great priority on and so definitely it's you know it's pushing it's pushing through and and we have female masculine group members that are doing great things um and yeah i mean actually i just we did a, a session last year which i loved on a personal level and also I think it was great for the movement where we had a zoom call with the Yoetz at Halakha in Israel and it was all about sort of female leaders like it's it's a conversation that's constantly happening in B'nai Kiva and that's great that it's sort of pushing the way and, and leading the way to a certain extent. I think uh, if I can just add I, and I think it's part of something broader as well which I think is fantastic which is you know more involvement more opportunities you know people playing taking a more active role you know in their Torah and their Judaism in the community you know whether it's men or women um, you know, there's something that, that, that we've seen, you know, over the last few years, and it's, you know, people have a thirst, you know, not just to be on the sidelines, not just to be spectators, 
but to be involved, to take an active role, to find the opportunity, to find the framework, to find the learning, to find the, you know, things where they can do and they can volunteer and they can be active. Um, and this is obviously, you know, one of those, uh, you know, one of those expressions is through uh, female learning opportunities, male learning opportunities as well, and, and, and other things. And I think that's great. Fantastic. So on this topic of finding opportunities, um, I would say that it's quite an Israeli characteristic to be proactive. If you want something in Israel, you have to. You, if it, in your market in the shuk, you shove, you push and shove, that's what you've got to do. <laughs> I, um, I guess I want to use this opportunity to ask now, two and a half years, uh, you've been in England and you've seen how us Brits operate, how us work. I know, Sarah, you are British yourself. However, you've had an excursion, you've come back. Now you've ha been able to dip into both the condiment of Israel and the UK. Um, what criticisms or compliments, if you want to give us some compliments, do you have of the British lifestyle? And what, what can we learn from, I guess, the Israeli attitude and Israeli life that we may not necessarily have yet as um, Brits? Ooh, good question. Okay, I don't want to criticize. I think we all have we all have what to learn from each other. And um, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, the cultural difference and, and the culture shock. And, you know, it may be surprising to some people. For me, you know, growing up in South Africa, um, so I grew up in England, you know, we'd come back and visited often. It's not, you know, there's not a foreign land or a foreign culture to us. Um, but nonetheless, I think, you know, as human beings, we get very, very quickly, we get used to things, you know, used to our surroundings. Um, and, you know, first moving to Israel was definitely a culture shock uh, of sorts. But, you know, after not, not that long, I think you get used to it. You get used to the culture and the way and, you know, the general sort of, uh, you know, sometimes it's a little bit of pushiness, you know, as you mentioned, you know, certainly on an external level. Um, and yet yeah, coming back to England was, you know, coming back to a foreign country, as we mentioned before, it's, you know, coming back to and, you know, th there was a lot of surprise um, a lot of that cultural shock, which which uh, which came in as well. I think just, you know, yeah, everything is much more, everything is much calmer, much more orderly, you know, much more polite. Um, you know, some of those things I think sometimes we can learn from in Israel as well. But, you know, one of the things I remember when we, when we first moved back, probably after a couple of months, you know, we started to invite people for Shabbos. So in Israel, you know, Thursday morning, you start, you start preparing uh, your Shabbos menu, you start thinking about whether you'll have guests or not. Uh, and, you know, we thought, okay, we're in England, no, this isn't Israel, everything has to be planned in advance, everything has to be much more... Um, yeah, we were so proud of ourselves. You know, right? and, and we thought, okay, Sunday night, you know, this is around right the beginning of the week, you know, we'll start inviting people. And we <laughs> remember, we called up a few people from the community and said, oh, sorry, you know, we're booked for the next three weeks, or, sorry, we're booked for the next two months, sorry, you know, we... This was probably in, uh, when was, I don't know, August. They said, well, we have a week in January that's open. And that was a little bit uh, interesting. <laughs> um, we realized, and then we started, you know, making lists and started planning, inviting people a little bit more in advance. It sounds strange to say that it was, it feels strange to say that it was strange coming back. But I really, like at the beginning, as I said, I felt like a foreigner. I remember also London's very different to Manchester. Yeah. And I would, we, everywhere we drove, we managed to arrive just at that hour of the day that you're not allowed to park there are all sorts of strange things that like are you allowed to park on a single yellow line I did pass my test in England all those years ago I can't remember what the rules are like little things like that but I remember um at one point I was actually tutoring science GCSE and A-level in both HASMOs um girls and boys so I was doing a lot of jetting back and forth and my um baby daughter she was a baby then was in the crash at HASMO girls and I remember parking the car I just run back from a class drove back from a class and has my boys there was no like I was parking in a space that like probably shouldn't be parking in and somebody just to run and get her and one of the security guards came and said I'm really sorry you can't park there and I've been in England for like a month and I was like no but you don't understand I'm literally just going to get my daughter now in Israel they would have been like ah said there like fine or like okay I'll just go and get her you stay by the car and then the security guard gave me this look of like but you cannot park there and it's just those little differences those like like that you get used to is in there uh, in Israel. I always say that no doesn't mean no. It generally means like, let's start a conversation. And that can be hard to get used to, but it also has incredible advantages to it. And and you sit opposite a clerk, a clerk in a um, government office and you have a conversation and maybe you'll cry or maybe this or maybe whatever, but there is sort of um, this 
interaction that takes place and sometimes things aren't as strict as we see here but um but also I remember just what you were saying about polite I remember once being on a it was an easy jet flight when we were visiting England we were going to visit my parents back in the days when back in the day when <laughs> yeah and it was easy yeah easy jet is still around yeah and um and I was waiting in the queue for something and I was standing behind like these um these ladies that had just been to visit Israel and they were like oh we are so glad to be out of Israel it was such a that everybody's just so rude and the Israeli people are so rude and I was fuming in my head and I had so many things that I wanted to say but because I'm also a good British person I just stood there and didn't say anything but the thing that came to mind is really that we're so used to talking about the Israeli mentality and the chutzpah and the this and the that but when push comes to shove they they are your family and strangers I mean like <laughs> I can't like you've seen stories in the last like few days like strangers just embrace everybody and you know it's just something else like yeah that's it I mean in Israel you know the, like I said you know the manners the politeness the you know pushing in the queues and you know customer service is not is not Israel's strong point oh my gosh. but <laughs> but uh, you know when, when when it comes down to it you know Israelis will open up their hearts and their homes to you um literally like their homes are yeah you know I, I remember I mean you know like you said, I mean, just, you know, an anecdote maybe from the opposite side, you know, people are very, uh, you know, they'll, they'll say whatever they think, they'll say whatever you want. I remember when we were in Israel, the first time we moved, you know, we moved homes, you know, the person who's coming into, uh, you know, the movers are telling us, you know, what they think, you know, what they think, asking how much we pay for rent, the guy who comes into all the washing machine is like, you know, asking you know, what your salary is. I mean, <laughs> you can't understand that, you know, to answer, not answer, I mean, you can, can you imagine somebody in England asking those kind of questions? No. But uh, give them but, such a dirty look. But, yeah. <laughs> but like I said, at the end of the day, you know, the same people, you know, uh, you know, the taxi driver will become your best friend. You know, they'll, they'll uh, really, you know, when the chips are down, they will, it's, it's one big family. When we, as I said, when we were sort of literally homeless in Israel, there's this person in our building who we barely knew, like we'd seen him once or twice um, and we'd moved into a friend's apartment and he was asking where we were and we explained how we'd gotten rid of, gotten rid of. we'd finished the lease on our apartment, we haven't gotten our visa yet. And he was like, you should have told me, we're going away soon, you could have stayed here. Like there is this like connection between people. That, and not just three months in advance. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely, it, take, it will take getting used to when we go back, but I'm also looking forward to it. Going back to the previous topic, you, you know, you've had a very difficult um, shlicha in, in being here over the pandemic, but at the same time, you've been leaders through all of this. And firstly, thank you so much, because um, hats off to you. It, it's not been easy for anyone, let alone to look, like, to look after themselves and their families, let alone like the whole community. Um, and, you know, not being able to see your family. But as leaders, I wanted to know what you guys Think, okay well obviously we've all had to like adapt and change you know various aspects of our lives throughout the pandemic and as we're coming out of it you know everyone's like rushing back to normal life and trying to you know just like sit back into their old ways but if there's anything that we've learned from it and that we should be trying to change or incorporate into our lives what what do you guys think that could be you know for example we've been using zoom a lot and like street when you're on popped out like anything along those lines either personal or communal what what do you think we should not be running back to do normally yeah it's a, it's a great question i think uh you know we're still in it you know we're still living through this we're still adapting we're still changing you know there will still be changes to come so it's, you know it's hard to know so i don't know when you know when this is going to end and are we ever really going to go back to normal whatever normal means yeah I, I think you know one of the things certainly what we what i hope we won't be rushing back to is you know is the rush is, is the rush of normal life, you know, that we've had, I think, you know, the pace of life is just, uh, you know, quite frantic. I think something we've, we've all realized over the last, you know, year and a half, and then things have slowed down, at least the beginning, you know, things started slowing down. But if you even think about, you know, the words that have been used, you know, not, not just by us, not just in the Jewish community, you know, across the world, you know, people have really been talking a lot about, you know, essential activities, you know, talking about key workers, talking about all these things. And it's, I'd like to say forced, but I think it's very, very easy to just go back, go back to the habit, you know, 
but hopefully this will force us to think about you know what are really the essential activities versus the non-essential activities you know who are the key people in our lives and, and and not and i think it's worth you know taking some time to reflect taking some time to stop you know before we do go back to normal whenever that is um, you know, are we just going to go back and slot into the old habits, the old routines and do things the way we did them before? And I think there is a danger that we may do that. But rather, you know, think about, you know, just because this is the way we've always done things doesn't mean this is the way we always have to do things. You know, just the things that are that are routine, that are ordinary, are those really the things that we want to be focusing on that we want to, have, you know, the most as, a, as our greatest priorities? I know you had some thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, when COVID first hit and we were locked down, it gave me the opportunity, probably in the first time since we'd been in England, to think and ask myself, where should my energy be going? And normally there's just so much noise. I could literally spend my whole day in, a, in like a reactionary mode, answering emails, answering things, going where I've been told to go, going where I need to go. And because of that noise, you just never have the time to stop and, and question and ask, is this the best use of my time? Is this the best use of my energy? Is this the best use of my emotional energy? And, um, and I really think that the, um, the biggest thing that we all have to learn and everybody's answers to the questions will be different, but is to ask those questions, is to constantly be taking the time to work out what their priorities are. And, um, you know, there are lots of things over the past year, year, are we, yeah, year and a bit, that I've been missing and I would love to incorporate back in. I mean, we, we used to have guests every Shabbos and host events and, and I'm missing the human interaction and missing the social interaction. But on the other hand, it's nice not having the pressure of having to think a month in advance, do I want to invite people or not going as crazy as um, is sort of accustomed in England to go when you have guests and things. So I can make the personal decision. What do I want to incorporate back in? And what would I actually rather be left behind? That reminds me, you're okay having sandwiches for Shabbat, right? No. <laughs> as, in, as in everybody, can, there is no right and wrong answer to this. And I think everybody has to make their own decisions, but we've been missing certain things and certain things have been nice to not have. So how can we prioritize those things that we've been missing? And yeah, I mean, Zoom, for example, Zoom existed before Corona, but, you know, I don't think anybody had the foresight to buy the shares in Zoom that they all should have because it pretty much, um, it wasn't used so often or as far as I'm aware, but it's the type of thing that has really opened opportunities and that's amazing to Zoom family members. You know, we were talking the other day about, about Skyping someone and like, and like now like Zoom is like, things have just moved on. Like our grandpa, our kids' grandparents, can read them a book over Zoom and they can interact and they're like, it's amazing. Um, but I don't wanna see that take the place of in-person interaction. Mm. And, and you know, I think that everything has its place within limitations. Like we were, we were in one extreme, we've been pushed to another extreme and now we have to find the happy medium, which is pretty much a summary of life, to be honest, trying to find the medium between lots of extremes. But um, it's definitely not easy if you, I don't have any quick tips of how to do that. Yeah, I, I think one of the things when you touched on, you know, one of the uh, things that we, we've realized and we've learned, I think we're still starting to realize now how much we've been missing it is that, you know, that human interaction. Zoom is great. You know, I mean, you know, we're doing this podcast. We are, um, we can have speakers from all around the world and, you know, all, all sorts of things. But uh, it's just not the same, you know, when, you, when you're sitting face to face with somebody in the room in the same place. We'll start to realize, you know, more and more, I don't think we actually have realized the extent of, of what we've been missing out. Well, Joel, uh, I mean, Sarah, you mentioned key workers and how much we valued them over the course of the pandemic. And if I'm able to say on behalf of the Tanua, you guys are very much key workers and not only during the, the pandemic, but generally, whether that's been rabbinic, hashkafic, pastoral, or all, all of the above, I'm sure uh, individuals are able to testify stories of how you've been able in ways that you may be not even aware of being able to help during the pandemic and um, we're very very grateful not only for that but of course that you've been able to join us uh, for this podcast um, thank you so 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 very much till next time everybody we will see you soon thanks guys thank you so much thank you so much and yes it's available everywhere, so stay tuned. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>